Hello and welcome to the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann, a listener-supported program. My guest for this episode is Toby Hemingway, author of the long-standing favorite book on ecological design, Gaia's Garden. His next blockbuster, The Permaculture City, was recently released by Chelsea Green. This latest volume, focusing on urban landscapes, forms the basis for the conversation today. We work our way through the book, and while doing so, discuss permaculture as a decision-making system and the importance of what permaculture practitioners have, for so long, called the invisible structures, our social and economic systems. Before we begin, I'd like to thank everyone who helps to make this show a reality. If not for every one of the listener supporters, I wouldn't be able to keep going, as all of this work is made possible by you. If you've thought about giving, do so now via the donate link on the right-hand side of the homepage at thepermaculturepodcast.com. If you would like to be part of the monthly member program, sign up at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast and receive a number of benefits, including early access to episodes, subscriber-only podcasts, and material that doesn't make it into the regular broadcast. Now then, enjoy this chat with Toby Hemingway, and I'll join you afterwards with thoughts on the ideas that arise here, as well as a class announcement and some updates. Then, Toby, if you're ready, could you give us a bit of your biography and background, how you came to permaculture and your work, and then we can discuss your latest book, The Permaculture City. Well, I came to permaculture through a fairly direct route, actually. My, my background is in science. I'm formally trained as a geneticist and spent about 15 years doing genetics research and really started getting um, suspicious and skeptical of the direction that biotechnology was going in the late 80s and early 90s, um, watching it be commercialized and watching particularly the agricultural products or genetic engineering be things that I really didn't agree with. I was in medical genetics, so we were, we were looking at cancer medications and things like that. But the company that I was working for, this hot little fun biotech research company in Seattle, found something useful and turned into a drug company very quickly. And I kind of woke up one day and said, wow, I'm a, I'm a mid-level manager in a drug company. And how on earth did that ever happen in my life? And at the same time, I had just met my wife. She um, wanted to live in the country. And we were looking at some land outside of Seattle. I was playing hooky for work one day in the Seattle Public Library, looking at homesteading and back to the land books. And there was this great big black book that I'd never seen before called Permaculture, a Designer's Manual. And I pulled it down and leafed through it and realized, okay, this is talking about climate and trees and ecology and shelter and energy and community and economics and patterns. And it's putting all these things together that I've always been interested in all my life, but I never understood how they connected. I didn't understand why I could be interested in shelter and energy and ecology all at the same time. And suddenly I saw it. This was, you know, Mollison had put it all together. I, 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 it kind of made sense of my life suddenly. And essentially, both my wife and I quit our jobs, moved to the country in southern Oregon, got a little more radical than just moving to Seattle, uh, suburban Seattle, and spent 10 years working on a rural property in southern Oregon and teaching myself permaculture and taking workshops and classes and traveling and looking at permaculture sites and never, never looked back. And uh, I took a course from Bill Mollison in the mid-90s, and he, when he learned that I had done a lot of science writing, he said, well, you know, the book that hasn't been written is a book on North American permaculture sites. And I thought, well, that, that's a great idea. Well, I'll try, try my hand at writing a book like that. And I started writing up about different permaculture sites around the country, visited sites, and wrote a series of site reports and thought that that was going to be the book, but it was really hard to write, and it was really boring just to, to read about, you know, well, the pond is over here, and next to the pond is the bamboo, and behind the bamboo is the gray water system, and it's like it was a really boring book, but fortunately I had hired an agent at that time who looked at it and said, you know, you need to rearrange this and turn this into a how-to book, not a collection of site reports. Nobody's going to want to read that but a how-to book on how to actually do this stuff would be good. So I owe it to my agent, Natasha Kern, for actually giving me the real feed of the idea for Gaia's Garden. And that became Gaia's Garden, and that took over my life. Uh, and 15 years later, Gaia's Garden is still kind of running my life in a, in a wonderful way. But now I have a new book out on urban permaculture, and uh, 
That's me in a nutshell over the last 20 to 25 years. And Gaia's Garden was one of the first books that seemed to come out of this new wave of permaculture publications and was one of my reintroductions to the material in the early 2000s and really seemed to set the stage for a lot of what's come afterwards. It's still incredibly well regarded within the community. And though I haven't seen sales numbers from the discussions about that book alone, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the number one selling book on permaculture, really historically. That's a testament to the quality of the material that you put in there and how accessible you made it for the audience and the people who read it. That was really my intention was there were a number of permaculture books and certainly permaculture one and two and the designer's manual Morrison's are full of information and are incredible books, but they're not a lot of fun to read. And I know that was a stumbling block for a lot of people. You kind of have to slog through them like they're textbooks. And what really I saw was missing was a good readable account, particularly for, for North America. There just wasn't anything. So I was kind of groomed to, to write that book and um, and have just been amazed at, at its success. I really thought as a first-time author that it would take me three or four books to get even, you know, if I was going to get any success at all, it would take a while. So I was dumbfounded after the first year or two really started doing very, very well. And I, I do think as far as total sales are concerned, I think it has sold pretty short from everything I hear that it pulled more copies than any other permaculture book. So I think I can probably call it the best-selling permaculture book in the world at this point, um, which, like I say, just, just blows me away. I, I never expected to, to have a successful book, and it's really kind of fun to be able to check that off on my bucket list. Okay, you wrote a successful book. Hooray! <laughs> now I can do other stuff. And I hold a copy of your newest book, The Permaculture City, in my hands right now, and I was fortunate enough to get a, an early a reader's copy before it went to final print and sat down, and though I'm a slow reader, I read that version in a day, and it just it really blew me away, and I think you have another great book in your hands, especially as we look at the number of people who are living in urban and peri-urban environments now, and I have to say, <laughs> from my own perspective, that The Permaculture City is the book that I, I feel that I wish I would have written three or four years from now, but you've beaten me to it. So much of the thoughts and ideas that you place here about the perspective of permaculture moving away from the land and to the places where people live are really poignant to where many permaculture practitioners find themselves now. There's a running thread through many conversations I've had with Dave Jackie and Larry Santoyo and others about how when a student first discovers permaculture, either through a design course or the literature, there's this huge focus on the land base and growing food. And then it seems three, maybe five years after that initial experience, as that whole systems thinking begins to take root in our minds, we begin applying permaculture more broadly to the other systems that we're engaged in. You know, I've talked with people who are software designers who are beginning to look at these ideas in their careers, but also community organizers and others. And as we begin to look beyond just growing food and the landscape, that there's a need for more of these ideas and information in an accessible way that you've presented to us. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the motivation for the Permaculture City and why you chose to include some of the things that you have. The fact is that most of us live in cities, which at least half the world's population is in cities proper. And if you include overall metropolitan areas, it's more like three quarters of the world's population. And I think exactly the evolution that you described is something that I went through. It actually took me a little longer. I probably took about 10 years before I started realizing permaculture was good for things other than growing food. Um, so other people are quicker than I am, I think, at that. But what permaculture's strength is that it's a very easy-to-digest approach to whole systems thinking. It kind of makes people a whole systems thinker unexpectedly and via the back door. I don't think it sets out from the beginning to say, hey, we're going to teach you about whole systems. It says, would you like a way to grow food in a more sustainable way? That's really the, the garden gate is how most people come to permaculture. And then suddenly you find that we've learned to grow food in a more ecologically responsible, sustainable, integrated way. And you, you suddenly realize we could do more than grow food. We could think about energy the same way or, or another permaculture strength is water. Thinking about water catchment or water harvesting and water use, suddenly you get a whole systems push to water 
and you're thinking watersheds, and you're thinking about city water systems. So permaculture has this ability to make make us into whole systems thinkers without making it a, a painful process. And one of the places that that's most needed is in urban environments. And that's what I started seeing was that people in cities were doing incredible things with permaculture. Really, the, the cutting edge seemed to be in urban environments. But while farmers were doing great things with permaculture and gardeners were doing great things out on, in rural landscapes, there were these people who were involved in the, the human piece in permaculture. That We were seeing so many places where someone had set up a really great garden and then the next tenants had moved in or the neighbors had not liked it or something had happened and the place had been destroyed. And we, we kept seeing over and over again that you can build a great technical setup. You can create a good garden or a, a whatever it is, a good machine, but someone's going to come along who doesn't understand it or doesn't like it or disagrees with it uh, or has other ideas and it's going to go away. It's really the human side of the sustainability questions that's the most important one. If sustainability were just a matter of buying a new machine or changing our techniques, we would have done it long ago. But it's the politics, it's the economics, it's the social side, it's the emotional side that's important. And that's what's going on in cities, and cities where people are forced to deal with the human issues. So there are all these people doing amazing work in all these cities all over the country, all over the world. And once I started getting wind of that, I got really excited about this is the dynamic edge of permaculture. This is where people are applying these whole system concepts to helping us work with each other better, not necessarily getting along with each other, which I think some of us think is really important, but we're not all going to get along. We're going to have different ideas. We're going to have different ways of doing things. But once we learn that the task of shifting human beings over to being whole system thinkers, that task is what's most important. Permaculture gives us tools for focusing on that task and getting it done. And that's the exciting piece to me that that urban permaculture is really working on. So doing the book was really a question of seeing who's doing the most interesting, most cutting edge, most exciting work in using permaculture with human systems. So that was, that was a ton of fun for me to do the research for the book and write it up. One of my friends is always fond of saying from many of the places that she goes in her life that you can be the sweetest, juiciest peach in the world, but then you'll meet that person who just hates peaches. Exactly. In looking at the human element of permaculture, is that something that you feel is lacking in the permaculture education and literature through much of its history, or is it just something that isn't being explored in a way that is accessible or for people to know about it? I think that Nowadays, but in a number of permaculture courses and, and permaculture teachers and permaculture communities, that there's this growing, rapidly growing awareness that the social side of permaculture needs more emphasis and is getting more emphasis. But I do think that for many years, the permaculture design course was essentially a course in techniques for growing food and producing energy. And then at the very end of it, uh, the last day, perhaps, or even half day, people would fit in the invisible structures piece, the part that talks about community and economics and, and livelihood and, and the other aspects of the of what we call the invisible structures. But that was kind of tacked on because the other stuff was learning how to build a solar power system or installing water catchment was fun and dynamic, whereas trying to figure out the social side of permaculture could be a lot more challenging for particularly a lot of the early permaculture teachers who I think of them or, or us as a pioneer species where we're not necessarily easy to get along with. You know, the prickly pioneer species who come into new territory and kind of push their way into it. And it was really the second and third wave of permaculture teachers that were a little later in the successionary pattern of being more compatible with others. So my hat's off to those pioneers but they, they didn't focus too much on the social side of, all right, how do we actually work together and cooperate with one another? So it's been in the last few years that it's been this tremendous upsurge in the social side of permaculture. And there are these wonderful people all over, uh, I'm speaking mostly about the U.S., but there are plenty of international countries, but people like Pandora Thomas uh, in the Bay Area, Starhawk uh, on the East Coast, 
uh, Lisa Fernandez and, and so many others who are really working on the social side of permaculture, doing doing terrific work. And it's interesting, I just listed three women, so I think it's it's women who are doing a, a lot of the social permaculture side, picking up that end of it and, and really pushing it along. And with that shift to the social side in the conversation, I'm also finding that there's a lot more understanding about how difficult growing food on a small property can be or how difficult subsistence farming can be. And that's one of the pieces that I felt that you covered very well in the Permaculture City is discussing that, you know, I've done this before and it's not the most enjoyable experience in the world to be focusing so heavily on growing food and trying to scratch out an existence from that, which was candid in a way that I had not experienced elsewhere and really struck a chord with me on how important it is to have those kinds of conversations about the practicality of some of the choices that we make and that if you are not used to some of these things coming to them, you know, in the middle of your life and trying to make that transition can be very difficult as opposed to there was a an outline that you gave about a whole systems approach to food security that I felt was a very realistic way for permaculture practitioners, wherever they are in their lives or where they live, on how to handle these kinds of ideas and to apply that whole systems thinking beyond just the garden and that, you know, zone one permaculture. Right. I mean, one of permaculture's real strengths, what what I've come to understand that permaculture really does is it provides us with a set of decision-making tools. It's not a set of techniques. It helps us decide how to arrive at a sustainable solution for an issue. So when, when we're looking at something like food security, it's really easy to default to something like, I've got to grow lots of food, or I've got to store up a lot of food, or I've got to grow most of my own food, or, or there's this series of very easy defaults that we go to around food security. And permaculture allows us, if, if we let it, if we really use our, our permaculture tool, to work through that in a much more systematic way and, and back up and say, all right, really, what, are, what am I trying to achieve when I'm thinking about food security? And then you can look at things like, all right, what are the weak pieces in my own personal food system? Is there a lack of food somewhere? Is it costing me too much money? Do I not have a place to store food? Is there not a good flow of food around me? So you can, you can ask things like, you know, does it make sense for me to be growing a lot of my own food? Or is there a good, resilient food network in my area that I can support and that I can help and that will take care of me? And one of permaculture's principles is that if we have an important function that needs to be met, we should be doing it in multiple ways. Right off the bat, that suggests to us that growing all your own food is not really a permaculture solution to food security. If you get hurt, if you get sick, if you have a crop failure, uh, if the, you know, the zombie turn up bannets, decide bandits come in and decide to steal all your food, you know, you're, you're, you're out of luck. Whereas if you, you know, again, using the permaculture decision-making process, you might think about, all right, what crops does it make sense for me to grow? What is really easy to grow in my area? What do I have, I have room to grow? What costs a lot to buy that would make sense for me to grow myself? Or what do I really like to eat a lot of that I can grow myself? And so you address what I would call zone one food needs. What what can I do myself really easily around food? What can I grow or produce? And maybe the answer is it's too hard for me to grow anything, but I have a way of earning some money that will allow me or do a trade or set up a network that will allow me to obtain the food that I believe in. Then you can move out to zone two and okay, what food is available in my neighborhood? What food is available in my community? And we can build a really resilient, strong community food network that way, rather than just default into how much food can I grow personally. So that's one of the strengths of permaculture is that it gives us a set of decision-making tools where we'll arrive at a really good solution. And food is a nice way to help us work through and give an example of those decision-making tools. So I find myself using permaculture zone system. You know, what, what food should I grow in zone one? What, what food is available to me in what I would call zone two, which means my neighbors and my community. And then zone three would be things like in farmers markets or locally owned food stores that will help build a resilient food network. And by the time we're done with that, then we can think of zone five as 
you know, chain stores in Costco or that's in Costco, and we we rarely go to those because we have a good resilient network built up in zone one, two, and three, and we don't have to ship our dollars outside of our community. We can use our own energy and our own money within our community to, to tie together that resilient food network. And once you've learned to do that for food, and you see that it's not about doing it all myself, it's about setting up a good community network and supporting systems around me that I want to see. Once you've done that for food, you can do that pretty easily. You can pour it right over to energy or water, and then you start to get sophisticated and realize, oh, I can do this for a livelihood. I can do this for income. I can do this for my my community networks or, say, my neighborhood, um, neighborhood association or my city government or these sorts of things. Suddenly, you see the same set of decision-making tool applies to a wide variety of the solutions that we need to surround ourselves with. That has been the real evolution for me and I think for others for phone calls we're seeing. It is this terrific toolkit that allows us to go through decision-making processes, whether it's you know planning our calendar for the day or whether it's trying to lay out a five-year plan for our life or whether it's deciding what's a reasonable way for me to get an income or how do I build a better relationship with my neighbor? It's, it's a terrific universal decision-making toolkit for arriving at sustainable solutions. I like that you focus on permaculture as a decision-making framework because for so long, and this is something that's been an ongoing conversation within my local permaculture community, much of the material that one finds about permaculture when you first scratch the surface and even after digging for a little bit, even though the ethics and principles are very forward in the material that most of what one encounters is about the techniques. It seems like many of the books that we have available are 90% techniques over and over again, because those are the pieces that someone can grab hold of and see whether it's an herb spiral or hugel culture or swales or whatever the flavor of popular technique is at the time. But that Again, going through the process of permaculture, once we get grounded in seeing what those techniques like and understand how they work, that it allows one to step back and get further into the material and figure out how to make decisions based within this framework that does right by Earth and ourselves and provides an opportunity then to build surplus and share with others. Was that something, permaculture is a decision-making toolkit, something that was part of your work from the very beginning, or was that something that you arrived at over time? Part of it was an evolution. I I saw that there was something bigger in permaculture when I first found it, that there was something more than techniques, but I didn't really understand what it was. I I simply knew that it was this amazing way of actually thinking about, about problems, thinking about food production, and I think that's that's something that Mollison understood as well. But it, it took me quite a long time to to really get my handle um, on it. But, and I, I have to thank a lot of my mentors like Tom Ward and Penny Livingston and Larry Santorio who really helped me see that that it's the decision-making side of permaculture that, that gives it its strength. And once you understand how it works in the garden or whatever field you're in, it lets you solve a lot of other problems. And I think that, that this technique focus uh, at first is something that, that we, at least in Western culture, are really trained to do. We're, we're taught to think about things and we're taught to think about methods. Now, it's, it's like learning to cook. You know, you, you don't do a study of here are all the ways that we can steam vegetables and here are all the ways that we can sharpen knives. And then you put all these things together to learn to cook. You're given a recipe that says, you know, here's, here's how you make beef stew. Here's how you make a Caesar salad. And you learn a series of techniques like that, and you memorize them, and you get them down. And after a while, you start to see the common threads and realize, oh, I could substitute garlic instead of onions, or we could do shallots, or we could even try something altogether different and see if that works. And, and eventually, you can go off recipe, and you start, you start being able to think in terms of cooking techniques where you can open up the fridge and go, well, we've got this and that and that and that, and I can put all those together and I can use steaming rather than frying. So you, you, you get a, a breadth of recipe building equipment for learning how to cook. So then you can actually use your cooking skills to make decisions about, all right, how do I arrive at a good meal? 
given the ingredients that I've got in the situation that I'm in. And formal culture is very similar, I think, in that it gives you this whole set of tools that you can look at and say, okay, given the situation I'm in, given, you know, I live in this place and I've got this issue going on, how can I arrive at a good solution? What are all the tools that are available to me? And when we're beginning, we only have a few tools. We have know, herb spirals and boo culture. And they're cool. They solve specific problems really, really well. But it's kind of like that hammer and nail story. If the only tool you've got is a hammer, then all your problems start to look like nails. And if the only tool you've got is boo culture, then suddenly everything starts to look like it needs a boo culture bed on it. And that can lead you into problems. But, but as we develop our toolkit and we get a broader way and we realize, wow, I've got all these potential solutions. I've got all these potential tools, and then you kind of have to scratch your head. And, well, so how do I arrive at which tool I'm going to use? And that's what permaculture does. It gives you, through its different methods and through the, and through the, the principles, it gives you a decision-making process that you can work through. You apply zones, you apply sectors, you apply needs and resources analysis, you make sure that you're in alignment with the principles. And then you can be pretty darn confident that you're arriving at a good solution. It's just that we, we're learning to broaden our toolkit from simply a bunch of different ways to do compost and a bunch of different ways to do swales and ponds. We're broadening them to, okay, what are the possible ways for making decisions in groups? You know, we have a whole bunch of tools for deciding things in groups of people. So given our particular situation, you know, is it a business meeting? Is it a neighborhood association? Is it a community meeting? Are we trying to establish a, a new nonprofit? You know, what, what is the situation we're in? And then given all the possible ways of making decisions, how can we arrive at a decision-making process that will work best for this specific group? And permaculture really helps you arrive at that sort of solution. So again, it's our understanding is broadening and broadening about how many different places permaculture applies to. And that's where we get into permaculture's understanding of patterns. You know, what are what are the patterns of people trying to make decisions in groups in this situation, in a business or in a community or in a nonprofit or in a family? You learn what the patterns are and then you can figure out what good decision making processes are for that particular set of patterns in that situation. So it's, again, it's a universal toolkit, but we need that pattern understanding in order to see how to apply it. When looking at those patterns, one of the things that you pointed to in the permaculture city was about how living in community with others closely together in the city provides a lot more opportunity for creativity because of our continual interaction with others. And you had some statistics in there about how much more creative productivity comes out of urban environments because of those close relationships. And one other piece that really stood out to me that was a part of my own cognitive dissonance living in a, in a semi-rural area where I have to commute to get to a lot of resources was just how much we're still tethered to those urban environments and all of the different pieces of civilization through our roads, through our power lines, through, you know, if we have a sewer system that runs out to a home somewhere that's many miles away from a central location. And it really reminded me of all the resources that wind up being used by trying to get further and further away from those urban centers. It's possible to live a very simple rural life and reduce your ecological footprint, but that's not how most Americans live. That's not how most rural people in in the developed world, the, the overdeveloped world, live. There are very few people who are growing all their own food. Most rural people, just like urban people, but over 90% of all rural people commute to a job or earn their livelihood from someplace other than on their land. So they're essentially suburbanites who simply live even further from their jobs and from urban centers. And that that was actually a big impetus for the Permaculture City book, was when I was living in the country and realized, you know, I'm still really tethered to the urban machine. It's just a much longer umbilical cord, and it's further away. It's harder to see, but I'm still really dependent on everything that's coming out of cities, whether it's cultural ideas and movies and, and books and things like that, or education, 
or whether it's the power line and the fuel system and uh, all of these things. And that, that was an eye-opener for me, that you can reduce your footprint living in the country, but most people don't. Most people actually increase their footprint when they move from, from the city to the country. And I began really thinking about cities as places that could be relatively greener, um, in, a, in an ironic sense, but relatively greener than rural areas because you can walk to your job, you can walk to your friends, you can walk to the store, you only have a 20-foot long driveway instead of a 200-yard long driveway, you only have 15 feet of power line out to the pole rather than a quarter mile of power line out to the pole, that sort of thing. It was a real eye-opener to me to, to suddenly realize that as Modern life is presently constituted in, in Western culture. Urban areas actually use fewer resources than suburban and rural areas, and, and we need to be working with that. We need to make that fact known, and we need to take advantage of it, and we need to help make our cities really livable for the people who are able to take advantage of, of all that urban life has to offer will want to stay in the city instead of saying, you know, yeah, when I get out into the country, then I'll be able to live. It's like, live, live where you are now. Make it a good place now uh, rather than, than having some dream of someday when I get out there, then I'll be able to practice permaculture. Do it where you are now because that's where you are. Start where you are. That's it's a permaculture principle right there is we start right where we are, start at your doorstep, and if your doorstep is 47th Avenue, you know, on 8th Street, then that's, that's your doorstep right in the city. And you point to something that many people have talked about throughout interviews. You know, Larry Santoyo mentioned to me that it's the landscape is the metaphor for our conversations. The architect Bob Tice talks about, you know, stay where you are and renovate what you have rather than inflicting yourself on some piece of land out in the middle of nowhere that doesn't need you there. And your book really reinforced for me the importance for people who are practicing this work that I know around here land can run $100,000 an acre or more. Property in the country can be two, three hundred thousand dollars for a modest home with just a little bit of land. Yet our cities, in many cases here in central Pennsylvania, are distressed, and urban property is much less expensive. And how permaculture practitioners can potentially afford a lot more for themselves in the resources they could free up by being in a city and taking advantage of all those things that you just listed of being in walkable communities and requiring less resources and then be able to reinvest in the space where they are by putting up solar or building gray water systems or being within the communities where they can create the most change by being able to say, you know, I'm a member of this neighborhood in this city. So that's why the members of city council should, you know, hear my voice when I come speak to them. Rather than being an outsider brought in as an expert, they can be the inside expert that is already a part of that community. That's one of the things that's so exciting about urban permaculture is that many cities, particularly the, the older cities in the east, but also I think a lot of cities in the Sun Belt where they're going to be running into energy issues in the very near future, but so many cities in the U.S. have got problems that permaculture really can help to solve. So if you're, I'm thinking of cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh, that, that Pittsburgh is really undergoing this terrific renaissance now, of looking at itself as a set of opportunities where prices have been pretty low and the city government has been encouraging artists and, and people with solutions to come move in or to stay there. So the, these are cities that have problems that permaculture is really well adapted to solve. It, it in, in so many cases, and I'm thinking of, of the Rust Belt cities where employment and commerce is a problem, the Sun Belt cities where they're out in the desert, so water uh, and certain kinds of energy are going to be real issues, or getting food to them is going to be an issue. Uh, and even the very expensive cities that are highly gentrified, like San Francisco and Seattle and places like that, where the problem there is, how can we keep vibrant young people in these cities? How do we not price out the people who will help keep these cities good places? Permaculture has got really good answers for all of these questions. It just seems like urban environments where vigorous, interested, dynamic permacultures can be offering solutions to absolutely relevant problems. This is a really exciting place that permaculturists can be working here. No matter where your city is, there is probably some problem that permaculture design could really help with. Throughout 
all this conversation about patterns in decision making and how being in an urban environment and this idea of the permaculture city takes us more in contact with community and people. It makes me think of one of my early teachers and mentors, Rico Zook. And one of the lines that he said in my teacher training was that ultimately we need to design ourselves out of the system. But in sharing that with us, he was talking about his projects in northern India, where it was as much about engaging the community and teaching the people around him about how these systems worked so that the people who lived there could maintain these permaculture projects long term after that instructor, that guru had left that environment. And I was wondering if you could speak some about the importance of developing community in a way that can maintain those kinds of systems, that we can work side by side with people as their ally and more as a, a guide on the side as we develop these projects, rather than a sage on a stage who then takes all their knowledge with them without putting the appropriate structures in place. The stage on the stage or the, the foreign aid model really has, has proven not to be a very sustainable one, that as soon as the expert or the funding or whatever it is goes away, the, if the project is not really integrated into the community and into the culture, then it's it's really bound to fail. And this, this again, is something that I think uh, savvy permacultures could be very good at because we are taught to be pattern recognizers, that if we come to a, a place, whether it's, it's Pittsburgh or New Delhi or, or wherever it is, that has some problem that permaculture can help with, we not only can bring a technical solution, but because we're pattern recognizers, from a community point of view, we can see what the cultural patterns are. We're not going to be as likely to introduce a technology that is too foreign, too abstract, too alien to the community. Now, I'm, I'm reminded of this wonderful story that one of my early mentors, um, Ben Haggard from Santa Fe, told me about working with a Pueblo community in his area that was going to work, be working with the Park Service to build a, an astronomical observatory. And Ben kept telling the Park Service that in order to have traditional astronomical observation methods as well as modern ones, the Pueblo really needed to be consulted, that they couldn't just build this observatory. And the Park Service didn't understand that. They had all this new technology and they thought it was going to be really cool. And the Pueblo people would love this big tourist attraction, but it didn't fit with the culture. And eventually the tribal elders said, no, you can't do this here because it doesn't take our culture into account. And that's what I think permaculturists, I mean, that was Ben's recommendation. We've like, got to take the culture into account. And this is what permaculturists spot right off the bat is we've got to integrate our solutions into the local culture. And if you do that, then the engine will be going. The thing will be running long after the expert is left. The culture will make a very gentle shift over to this sustainable method. It's not going to be asking them to give up cooking with fire and new solar cookers, where a lot of people found that doesn't work. You give them a more efficient stove so that they use less firewood. You don't say, stop cooking with wood, use solar stoves, because that's just too alien for them. And any permaculturist is going to recognize that kind of pattern, get it right off the bat, and say, all right, here's how we can integrate our solution into the culture so that long after we're gone, the culture will continue to retain it and keep using it. Thank you, Toby, for joining me today to discuss your book in particular, but also permaculture very broadly as a decision-making system. I really appreciate your perspective on all of this and to hear it from someone who is as well-respected in this community to have these kinds of conversations. Before we bring this to a close, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? Well, I think what we've done in talking today, Scott, is getting across this idea of permaculture as a set of decision-making tools. And that's really the, the focus of, of the new book, The Permaculture City, is, is, okay, if we see a little bit about how to apply permaculture to gardening, what does permaculture's tools have to say about energy? What does it, what does it have to say about water? What does it have to say about shelter? And in particular, how can we use permaculture's tools for community and for livelihood? And so that, that's really what I'm trying to do in this book is broaden all the ways that permaculture's toolkit can be used and show the toolkit in some novel situations and, and showcase 
some of the work that a lot of just amazing people are doing in applying permacultures tools in brand new ways. So that's the new territory that this book goes into, and that's what I hope a lot of the listeners and other people will be able to get from this book is, is we've got room to bring permaculture into whole new realms. It's really exciting, and there's room for all different kinds of fields and disciplines to get involved in permaculture because of the, the breadth of that toolkit. So thanks very much for having me here today. This has been great. And thank you again, Toby, for joining me today. All right. Thanks, Scott. It's been a pleasure. And that was Toby Hemingway, author of The Permaculture City. You can find out more about his work at patternliteracy.com. His latest book is currently available through Chelsea Green. There's a link that you can use to order that on the podcast website at thepermaculturepodcast.com. If you do so, that is an affiliate link and helps to support the show. Before we get to my thoughts, a class announcement. October 2nd through the 11th, 2015, Dave Jackie is teaching a nine-day intensive course on forest garden design at Feathered Pipe Ranch near Helena, Montana. This is the first time in three years this course has been offered in the United States. The all-inclusive class allows students to learn how to mimic forest ecosystems and build in a number of valuable characteristics, including stability and resilience, things that will be useful in a changing world. As the recent interviews with Dave have expressed, you can also expect this course to explore the human side of design, including the social and economic elements, as were discussed today with Toby as part of the interview. Participants will also have the opportunity to design multiple forest gardens, including one for the course site, as well as another for the 6th Ward Forest Garden Park, something that I discussed with Caroline and Jesse of Inside Edge Design during our interview on social system design. Find out more at InsideEdgeDesign.com. Now then, my thoughts at the moment. To me, this book and the interview you just heard are vital to changing the conversation about permaculture away from just the landscape and growing food, as these are problems that are technically solved. We know how to raise up plants from seed, cutting, or graft. We understand the techniques to use in a wide variety of situations in any climate, even if that means making modifications to the land through ponds or swales or creating physical structures, such as greenhouses or stone walls to act as thermal mass. Conventional and organic agriculture have a lot of information for us to pull from, as do the rapidly growing fields of agroforestry and agroecology. Where things go sideways is in reaching a larger audience with these ideas, not just in mainstream culture, but also in the permaculture community at large. The landscape is the focus of the permaculture design course, and many of the books that we'll find, and as a result, Many of us get stuck there, myself, and as you heard, Toby included. In the beginning, this is the place where it all starts. Plants, animals, food, fuel, fiber, medicine, they form materials and techniques and yields. They're easy to see and engage in. But now, 40 years later, we need to go back and dig through Mollison's big book of permaculture and remember chapter 14, Strategies for an Alternative Nation. We need to learn how to build and work in community with one another. Now that the thorny pioneers have blazed a trail into the depths of the jungles, plains, and cities, and as they did so, they set down roots, many of us have had the time to flourish in the shade of their experience and the work that came before us. But we've done so long enough. Now we need to be the specialists that come in, the growers, the builders, the organizers, and the communicators, to fill in the gaps of our understanding and expand what we do to reach all aspects of human life. We have the potential for permanent human agriculture. Now let's work on building the permanent human culture and retain the aspects of civilization that matter to us. Thankfully, we can do so using the same system of design as those who came before us and show others how to create a different world. We can tell the stories of how what will come can be different from what has been and what is. Together, though climate change and other obstacles may seem insurmountable, we can bring prosperity and abundance to all life on Earth. We can get the next story right, and with it, get the future right. I am hopeful for what will happen next, as is a recurring theme in my work as of late on engaging what was once seen as invisible. It was quite an experience to hear what Toby had to say on this subject, given his many years of experience and the place of respect he holds in the community. From my time with him in conversation and also in reading his book. I think that the Permaculture City is a fundamental resource that I recommend everyone who is listening pick up and read. 
If this interview is your first exposure to permaculture and you liked Toby's perspective, get a copy of Gaia's Garden, read it, and then read The Permaculture City. If you're someone who finds their thoughts continually revolving around the land, read The Permaculture City and see the broader scope of decision-making that permaculture can help us engage in. For those of you already working on issues of social and economic systems, especially in the urban environment, pick up a copy and know that you are not alone in your work, and there are many people stepping out from what was to create a new now. Along the way, wherever you go, I am here to lend a hand. I'll walk beside you until such time as our paths part. If I can be of service to you in any way, get in touch. Email show at the permaculturepodcast.com, call 717-827-6266, or for those of you who are international listeners, if you have Skype and want to get in touch, my screen name there is Permaculture Podcast. You can also, if you want, send me a letter, as I do so love receiving mail in the post. The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. As we draw this to a close, on Wednesday, August 19th, 2015, I'm going to be attending a potluck in Berea, Kentucky for an evening discussion about permaculture. That's being organized by Michael Beck of The Push. Though it's short notice, once I have a flyer for that event, I'll pass it around if you are in the area and able to attend. That event kicks off my time in Kentucky, as from there I'll be at Radical Gathering in Bowling Green, August 20th through the 23rd, 2015. Come out and join me, as well as Eric Perro and other members of The Push, for a weekend of workshops, entertainment, and community building. Tickets are currently on sale, and the entire weekend is only $25 for adults. Those attendees, 16 and under, are free to attend. And here I'd like to give my deepest thanks to Meg Harris for being part of the team organizing this event and for inviting myself, Eric, and all the other presenters and musicians for this weekend. It's going to be a blast. Find out more at RadicalGathering.com. And with that, so comes the end of this episode. Next up is a short piece on Monday, August 10th from Taylor Prophet. Until then, spend each day creating a better world, the world you want to live in, by taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.